unplugged in a third COVID wave forces lockdowns throughout Europe and a struggle to roll out vaccines. So at the moment for much of Europe, it's a race between uh, vaccinations and infections. Rare side effects from two vaccines provoking vaccine hesitancy. For the people who are hesitant, we need to make vaccine free. We may need to make it convenient. We need to make clear uh, that it's safe and effective and we need to preserve that confidence by doing things like pausing with the J&J &J vaccine. And in Africa's hardest hit nation, COVID's impact on the divide between urban and rural life. Unplugged in, vaccine and immunization. Hello and welcome to Plugged In. I'm Greta Van Susteren reporting from Washington, D.C. It has been more than a year fighting COVID. It has meant social distancing, masks, and hand washing. Now the United States in the process of reopening. To facilitate the reopening, more than 75 million people in America are now fully vaccinated. This number easily reaching President Joe Biden's goal of 100 million shots in his first 100 days as the new president. Europe, on the other hand, stands in sharp contrast. Its countries are preparing for another lockdown as a third wave of infections meets a slow vaccine rollout. Making matters worse, some have concerns about a rare side effect from one of the vaccines. We begin our coverage in London with VOA reporter Henry Ridgewell. Back in lockdown and stretched to the breaking point, restaurant owners gathered in Rome Monday to protest government orders to close. We are tired of this. We need to return to work. We can't just do it anymore. Italy is one of several European countries struggling with a third wave of the virus. France, Germany and several other states have extended lockdowns. Doctors warn more young people are being hospitalized with the virus. Germany's chancellor has this stark warning. This third wave might turn out to be the toughest one of all for us. The surge is driven by the so-called B117 variant of the virus, first identified in Britain, which was hit hard in January. But now Britain is bucking the European trend. Pubs and shops reopen Monday as hospitalizations have fallen to levels last seen in the summer. More than 60% of British adults have received a first dose of vaccine. There is a huge wave of third wave of um, COVID sweeping Europe at the moment. And that's in part due to the fact that not very many, high proportion of their population has been vaccinated. Vaccination programs are, are complicated things and they do rely on public confidence. Polls show public confidence in the AstraZeneca vaccine in Britain is around 75 percent. But a majority of people in France, Germany, Italy and Spain believe the jab to be unsafe. Confusion over trial data led to the vaccine initially being restricted to those under 65. But in a policy reversal, several countries are now restricting the vaccine to older age groups after cases of rare blood clots emerged among younger people. These are very rare events. They still exist, but we need to balance that against the risk of developing COVID or developing severe disease or even dying from COVID. And in most places and for most people, that is a much, much, much greater risk. Europe is trying to boost public confidence. France's Prime Minister was given the AstraZeneca vaccine on live television. After a slow start, inoculation programs are gaining speed, using vaccines from Pfizer-BioNTech, Moderna, AstraZeneca and Janssen. Germany gave a record 720,000 doses in one day last week. But Europe's troubled rollout of the AstraZeneca vaccine has implications beyond its own borders, as global public confidence in the drug appears to be falling. The AstraZeneca shot is cheaper and easier to produce than other vaccines and can be kept at normal refrigerator temperatures. And so for all of those reasons, I think this vaccine is of utmost importance. It's kind of the backbone of the global vaccination campaign. 
The African Union last week cancelled plans to procure the AstraZeneca vaccine, citing a desire to diversify its options. The bloc said the decision was unrelated to concerns over blood clots. But health experts say it could further fuel vaccine hesitancy, and they are calling for global awareness campaigns to counter misinformation. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. The European Union's goal of vaccinating 70 percent of its population by summer is threatened by a combination of vaccine shortages, questionable deals and safety concerns. I spoke to our Henry Ridgewell about the challenges ahead for Europe. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine as well has not yet been approved by the Medical Council in the UK. It's a different scenario in Europe. The, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has been approved there, although it's not a huge part of the vaccine rollout on the European mainland. The difficulty is that you have these drip drip scenario of doubts around the vaccine, of uh, possible side effects. Um, initially, you'll remember that because of confusion over data from the trials, the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine wasn't given to older age groups. And now, with this news of possible blood clots among younger age groups, it's being restricted only to the older adults. So this confusion, this slight back and forth has really undermined confidence in Europe, certainly in the AstraZeneca vaccine. And the most recent polls show that actually a majority of people on the European mainland don't believe that the vaccine is safe. And with the, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine also pausing because of these blood clots, I think there is a, a job to do for European governments to convince publics that it is safe. What about the actual supply? Is Europe getting the supply that uh, it feels it should be getting or is it getting undersupplied? For the AstraZeneca vaccine, the supplies are still full and short of what was supposedly contracted under the contract signed between Europe and AstraZeneca. There have been further delays because many of these AstraZeneca vaccines were being uh, manufactured in India at the Serum Institute in India. They were supposed to be supplying many vaccines to Europe. That has been delayed, partly because India says it needs the vaccines itself and partly for other reasons of quality uh, and control. So uh, certainly through February and March, there has been a big delay for Europe in, in trying to source the vaccines that it needs. And there have been political issues as well, because the AstraZeneca vaccine was developed partly in Britain, of course, in conjunction with Oxford University is manufactured here. Britain is not sending any of those AstraZeneca vaccines uh, across the English Channel to Europe. However, European manufacturers are sending the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine the other way back into Britain. And so that has been a real sore point. Don't forget that comes in the wake of Brexit and all the political shenanigans that went on with that as well. For the rest of Europe and for the other vaccines now, production is ramping up. So we've seen huge sports stadiums converted into mass vaccination centers. Europe still lags far behind the United States and Britain in its vaccination rates. But when we get to summer, I think we'll see that actually there's probably only going to be a few weeks between all adults being vaccinated across all of these Western developed countries. As I mentioned earlier, the U.S. recommends a pause in using Johnson & Johnson's COVID vaccine out of an abundance of caution, because like with the AstraZeneca vaccine, there have been rare cases of blood clots. VOA senior White House correspondent Patsy Wiedekuswara reports on the impact this pause will have on the U.S. vaccine rollout. U.S. federal health agencies called for the suspension of the Johnson & Johnson coronavirus vaccine after six women developed rare blood clots within two weeks of receiving the shot. Experts say the clots were observed in the sinuses of the brain. One woman died. Almost 7 million Johnson & Johnson shots have been delivered in the U.S., making the risk less than one in a million, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The White House said the pause has been put in place out of an abundance of caution and will not significantly impact vaccine rollout. The J&J &J vaccine makes up less than 5 percent of the more than 190 million recorded shots in arms in the United States to date. The Biden administration says the U.S. has secured enough Pfizer and Moderna doses for 300 million Americans and will continue to administer an average of over 3 million shots per day. 
Still, the Johnson & Johnson suspension is expected to scare off those already hesitant to get vaccinated. That's about 20 percent of Americans, according to polls. It will also make it harder to reach underserved communities since J&J &J doses do not have to be stored at ultra-cold temperatures and is the only single-shot vaccine being used in the U.S. Think about homeless populations where it's very difficult to, to find those people a second time. Um, so even if you go out to, you know, mobile clinics to certain populations, it's just very hard to, to get to them twice. And so a single dose vaccine is a great tool uh, for that kind of vaccine outreach. Meanwhile, several countries have either suspended the AstraZeneca vaccine or stopped giving it to younger people, also due to the potential danger of rare blood clots. The J&J &J vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine are made in very similar ways, different from Moderna and Pfizer. And of course, one of the questions is, if this blood clotting event is related to the vaccines, what's special about these vaccines that might induce these blood clotting events? We don't know the answers to that yet, but that's part of the investigation. Issues with AstraZeneca and J&J &J are complicating vaccine rollout in Europe and other places. But the executive director of the European Medicines Agency, Emmer Cook, insists that the risk of death from COVID-19 is much greater than the risk of side effects. I think it's, it's important that we give the message that uh, vaccines will help us in the fight against COVID and we need to continue to use these vaccines. As of now, Johnson & Johnson said there is no clear causal relationship between these rare blood clot events and the vaccine. Patsy Widakuswara, VOA News. This week marks the start of Ramadan, observed by Muslims around the world. In the Midwestern U.S. state of Minnesota, faith leaders at one mosque are encouraging worshipers to get vaccinated against COVID-19 as part of a broader effort to save lives. VOA's Carol Gunsberg tells us more. <laughs> Sharif Mohammed, the imam of Dar al-Hijra Islamic Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota, is using his sermon at a midday prayer to try to boost the Somali-American community's confidence in the COVID-19 vaccine. In collaboration with medical professionals, the mosque is hosting a vaccination clinic. And we are trying to put the faith and the health care together. And when the people see and the community see their mosques, the mosques, they come and pray, who also hold a, a vaccine. It's part of a nationwide effort in which religious leaders of all faiths have been enlisted to support vaccination, especially among people of color. The head of the National Institutes of Health made that point at a recent vaccination clinic at the U.S. National Cathedral in Washington. Unfortunately, many who could most benefit because they are at highest risk of serious and even life-threatening infections, are still holding back. Houses of worship are houses of hope. In past years, some in the local Somali-American community have heeded anti-vaccination messages, including the discredited conspiracy theory that the vaccine against measles, mumps, and rubella caused autism. Religious leaders say they are now trying to fight a new wave of conspiracy theories against COVID vaccine. Sidao Abdi Sharif Mohammed just got his first vaccine shot at the mosque. Oh, this virus is serious. Any Muslim, you need, please, this is a requirement to take this shot. Don't listen all this conspiracy that people are talking about. This is kind of medicine. Islam is not against any medicine. Community organizations involved with this program say immigrants need to protect each other by getting vaccinations. In the immigrant community in particular, we grow up in multi-generational households. And so to protect one another, we must wear our masks like we are today, and we must also get vaccinations. In the United States overall, more than half of all COVID cases and almost half of all the country's 550,000 deaths have been among people of color, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. For Syed Sala in Minneapolis, Carol Gunsberg, VOA News. In the U.S., the rate of COVID-19 vaccinations is speeding up. According to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, 
about 30 percent of America's age 18 and over population is now fully vaccinated. U.S. decisions about vaccines could have broad implications for the global community. Dr. Tom Frieden served as the CDC director during the Obama administration. We spoke earlier. What's happening now is that younger people who are unvaccinated are getting the disease, and that's who you see because older people are largely protected by vaccines. We're in the U.S., we're just not there yet. We don't have vaccination at a high enough rate to be relaxing the restrictions as we have. Because of that, we're seeing a lot of spread in many parts of the country, a lot of hospitalizations and far too many deaths. We've gotten hardened to the numbers. It's great that there are now uh, many fewer deaths every day from COVID in the, in the U.S. than there were before, but there's still 500 to 1,000 deaths every single day. That's a shocking number of deaths. Dr. Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca are both uh, hitting sort of barriers or have, uh, with, with getting the vaccine out because there's been some question about them. What, what can you tell me about this? Well, uh, what we know is that there appears to be a very rare adverse event and we need to learn more. We need to learn who's at risk. Uh, can it be predicted? Can it be treated? Can it be avoided? But right now, you're seeing about a one in a million rate of a serious adverse event having to do with clotting, uh, how the blood clots. And what's interesting, Greta, is that if you look at the illness that uh, COVID, the disease, causes, a lot of that is from clotting. You see clotting in the lungs and elsewhere. So it, there's something about uh, this virus and or our immune response to it that may in rare cases with the vaccine, but commonly with the virus itself, cause a serious health problem. When you say one in a million, that's, I mean, I, I don't want to sound cold, but that seems a very low likelihood. I think, you know, even peanut butter sandwiches might create more for some children who have allergies to peanuts and go into anaphylactic shock. Is one in a million sort of an alarming number well, we wish it were completely safe. Uh, there's an old saying from Ben Franklin that the only thing that's certain in this world is death and taxes. And just as no vaccine is going to be 100% effective, no, uh, no treatment of any kind is going to be 100% without problems. But we would rather not see any serious or life-threatening reactions from a vaccine that's given to healthy people to prevent the infection in the first place. So it's something that needs to be taken quite seriously. Yeah, do other vaccines have zero risk? Vaccines for other diseases? There are um, very rare situations in other diseases where there may be problems. Uh, those problems may be serious, but rarely fatal. So it's, it's somewhat rare to get an adverse effect that can be fatal. And that's something that really does give us pause. Now, the fact is with uh, COVID having already killed over 3 million people around the world, clearly, if you look at the risks and the benefits, uh, the benefits are going to outweigh the risks. And right now we're in a terrible crunch because we have the virus increasing and not enough vaccine. So that creates all sorts of challenges. Uh, over the coming months and, and years, we may figure out how to make the vaccines more effective, work well against the variants, and if the serious health but rare health problem is confirmed, how to predict it or avoid it or treat it. But right now, we've got limited vaccines and too much virus. Well, it seems to me those six women out of a million, I mean, that sounds horrible to me as a layperson, but I didn't know if the statistics were such that that is sort of un regrettably sort of in the medical community, a research community, you know, not, not, a, you know, not a significant number. Well, uh, any death is significant. And so if, in fact, the deaths were uh, an adverse event to the vaccine, that's something that has to be taken very seriously. All right. It seems to me there are four categories. Um, one is those who've had the vaccine. I've had the Moderna. Those who want it and can't get it yet for some reason. Then there are those who are, are called uh, have hesitancy uh, because for, they're waiting to see what happens to the rest of us, essentially. And then there are those who are deniers who will never take it under any circumstances. When you take a look at that, that group, um, what, what's the message to them? Well, I think the message has to be different in different groups. We have to listen to what people are concerned about, address those concerns, and then find the right messages and the right messengers for each community. For the people who are adamantly opposed, I would just say, let them be. 
you know, engaging with them is only going to make them dig in more deeply. But for the people who are hesitant, we need to make vaccine free. We may need to make it convenient. We need to make clear uh, that it's safe and effective. And we need to preserve that confidence by doing things like pausing with the J&J &J vaccine until we learn more. And we need to tell stories, real stories, about the suffering that people have when they get COVID, about the long haul COVID that can cause problems for weeks or months, or we hope not, but possibly years, and about the freedom that vaccination is going to bring, because it is with vaccines that we will conquer this pandemic, but we have to do it as a world. So this is a really important point, Greta. Your vaccine protects you, but if many people around you are vaccinated, you're going to be even safer. So vaccines work on an individual level, but they also work on a community level. The more of us who are vaccinated, the safer all of us are. So yes, you've got a chance of getting infected even after you've gotten vaccinated, but if everyone around you is vaccinated, that chance is vastly lower. But the same is true with masks. The more of us mask up, the safer all of us are. The quicker we get vaccinated, the safer all of us are. And that's true within countries, and that's true globally also. And that's why it's so important that as a world, we come together and scale up production of all vaccines, especially mRNA vaccines, and get the world vaccinated as rapidly as possible so we can crush the curve and leave the pandemic behind. Dr. Thank you very much as always. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Always a pleasure speaking with you, Greta. Pandemic lockdowns impact city dwellers differently than people living in the countryside. In Africa, large-scale lockdowns have sealed off residents in major cities like Lagos, Johannesburg, and Nairobi from their rural neighbors. VOA's Anita Powell visited one small South Africa town to see how its residents are coping under pandemic restrictions. It's hard to see COVID-19 here in the village of Kamatsamo in rural South Africa. On a recent day, most residents weren't diligently wearing masks outdoors, as is the law. But the pandemic is deeply felt here, say residents, who point not to death tolls, but to economic and social devastation. It's been a problem, like a really problem, a big problem to me. 22-year-old Pakale Sambo wants to become a carpenter and eventually set up her own carpentry shop. But that dream ended when the pandemic arrived. Because uh, I can't continue with my carpentry studies. I just stopped uh, and I can't even start my own business because the, the money is too low. People are complaining they can't even buy this fruit. They are complaining. They say it's too much money. I'm, I'm being expensive or something. They say that. Data about COVID's impact on Africa's urban-rural divide is still being gathered. But one recent study from a group of Nigerian and British researchers warns that rural African communities risk being left behind in the pandemic because of the lack of amenities like good road networks and strong infrastructure like clinics and hospitals. Big efforts such as vaccination campaigns are much more difficult in rural environments, says Freddie Nkosi, country director of an NGO in the Democratic Republic of Congo that focuses on remote, rural, low-income countries. You need uh, to keep uh, the vaccines in the cold chain uh, environments. And you need uh, to train the people who will uh, transport the vaccines. You need to train the people who will be uh, using the vaccines, I mean, the health workers. Uh, so getting all these different pieces of, of puzzles uh, in a very short period of time, uh, that's very, very challenging. For a town like Kamatsamo, which has 23,000 residents and is less than a day's drive from Johannesburg, that is doable. And for that reason, residents say they prefer to stay here. It's better to stay in a small place because we have a small people there than a big cities. Because in the big cities, there's a lot of people. Some of them, some of them. They don't know about COVID, they are stubborn, they don't know about, they don't care about that thing. I think around the rural area is much better than the city, because there's now a lot of people. Actually, it's, I think it's safe to be in the rural area. But Nkosi says his experience in the largest country in sub-Saharan Africa is concerning. What little of it he gets to see. I travel in over five provinces so far where I see uh, 
disparity between what is happening in the urban area or in Kinshasa and what is happening uh, in most of the rural areas where, for example, if I have to start with the health workers and community health workers, uh, in the rural areas, they have limited access uh, to personal protective equipment uh, compared to those who are in the urban areas. But rural African life has always been complex and resilient. This town has existed in some form for hundreds of years, through wars, epidemics, and upheavals. This pandemic, in a way, is just a blip in its history. Anita Powell, VOA News, Kamatsamo, South Africa. Before we go, a few moments to remember Prince Philip, the Greek-born husband of Queen Elizabeth, Great Britain's longest reigning monarch. He died April 9th at the age of 99. Best known for his sense of duty to the Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh had a sense of humor as well. Here is VOA's Henry Ridgewell. He was a man of the times, the rock behind one of the most extraordinary monarchs Britain has ever had. Philip Mountbatten met Elizabeth while he was a naval cadet. She was a shy princess. They married in 1947. When she became queen, he found it very difficult to give up his naval career, says Philip Ede, author of the book Young Prince Philip. He'd been an extremely successful, um, extremely highly regarded naval officer in, in, in the British Navy, and he was tipped for the very top. He was tipped to be, you know, become head of the Navy. And so to have to give that all up in order to become the sort of second fiddle to his wife, you know, he was a very overtly masculine character and not one who was going to take easily to this sort of life of, of walking a couple of paces behind the Queen. When asked in an interview what he thought of his role, Prince Philip replied, I don't. He grew up with a very strong sense of duty and he realised that this, his duty was first and foremost to, to support the Queen in, in, in her work. And that was really by far and away his most important. How he saw his role, that was really at the top of the list. Over seven decades, Prince Philip navigated the highs and lows of a royal family permanently in the public eye, including the death of Princess Diana in 1997. Take care of the boys. That's what we've been doing. Prince Philip was known for his wry sense of humour. <laughs> which came in handy whenever he had to brush aside any suggestion of his role as a secondary figure. He once said his best speech was in 1956 when he opened the Summer Olympics with eight words. I declare open the Olympic Games of Melbourne. His jokes on occasion caused offence, but he had a serious and lasting effect on the monarchy, pushing it to change with the times. That's something Philip has always saw for himself, is this idea that the monarchy must evolve. For example, he was very pro having the cameras in for the, uh, Elizabeth II's coronation in 1953. You know, he was one, you'd think because of his overall reputation, he'd be one of the people who was quite conservative, but actually, no, he saw television as the future. People want to see more of their monarchy. Prince Philip retired from official royal duties in 2017. A year later, he was involved in a serious car accident while driving near the royal family's country estate at Sandringham. His last public appearance was in July 2020 at Windsor Castle. Fulfilling his roles as consort and father, Prince Philip's effect on a 1,200-year-old institution is a monarchy more visible and relevant to its people, a legacy he forged from his place two steps behind. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. That's all the time we have for now. Thank you to my guest, former CDC Director Dr. Thomas Frieden. And stay up to date on the latest news at voanews.com. And do follow me on Twitter, at Greta. Thank you for being plugged in.